I'm Rishi Jain, and I'm here to talk about game development, the Ruby way. And I'm all the way from India. I know, it's a long way from home. It has taken me one bus ride, two change of flights, two change of trains, and a tram to finally reach Ghent. And it has been awesome. And I work for this company called Joe Software. So, and Josh is a Hindi word which means enthusiasm. A lot of people read it as Josh software, but it's Josh software. And we believe programming is an art. And we're not just about work, since a lot of our work depends on open source community. We believe in contributing back to the community in whatever way is possible, by doing open source contributions, writing gems, JS libraries, or organizing RubyConf India. We have been doing that for past five years now. So, and personally, I love conferences. Not only because I get to meet new people, but uh, it takes me to different places and I get to know about different cultures and it's very important. So when I got that wonderful email from the R camp organizers that your talk has been selected, I asked myself, what do I know of Belgium? What are some of the things that I could relate with? And this is the first thing that came to my mind. Belgium football players, right? I love football. I've been playing football. I've been watching football for so long. And this is one of the things that I could relate to. So uh, I ask, any football fans in the house right now? Already, some of you, cool. So one of the things that is clear is not everybody in Belgium loves football because that is one of the things that I've heard about Belgium, that people love football here, but not really. Then, <laughs> the second thing that almost everyone in the world could relate to with Belgium is the chocolates, right? So, when I was coming over here, I told my friends that I'll be going to Belgium, and they were like this all the time. Chocolates, chocolates, chocolates. I was like, okay, <laughs> I'll get some chocolates for you guys. So, moving on to games. How many of you are like passionate gamers? Like, every night you can play games all night long. Yeah, so, some hands there, cool. How many, of like to, like, how many of you like to, you know, don't mind playing games in, when you're traveling or when you're working in a meeting or something? Yeah? <laughs> cool, cool, some hands there. Now the most interesting one. How many of you have built a game, like from scratch? Alrighty, some of you have. That's good, that's good for me. Not all of you have built a game. So, when it comes to gaming, I consider myself a full stack senior game programmer, right? I'll break this down for you. Full stack, because every job opening that I see these days are all about full stack developers, right? Everyone wants a developer who could come in the first day and start solving the greatest problems computer science have ever faced, right? Naming. So, I'm a full stack developer. I also consider myself senior because most of you have not written a game and I've written like two, three small games. So I'm a senior. <laughs> so, I'm a full stack senior game programmer. So it's only fair that we start off with the history of gaming. And I think it started this way, right? So I have a few games here, which I thought really impacted the history of gaming. And I believe this was the first game. It's called Pinball. I was very fortunate to have a computer at a very young age. And I used to play this game on the Windows machine. And there was not a lot to do in this game, except that every time the ball hits a different object, it produces a new sound. And I love that. So I love this game. I've played a lot of it. Uh, any of you have played pinball, like on a machine, Windows or actual board or something? Some of you have. OK, cool. The next game, which I think is really important in the history of gaming, it's the Pong game. Four engineers built this game. And as you can see, it's an arcade box with a couple of joysticks on it. So it was a multiplayer game. And it was great vision back then to realize that people will love playing games with each other. But 
it didn't hit it off for them commercially because it was really difficult to find another player to play a game with. So gaming was considered dull kind of. So it didn't, it didn't work out commercially for them, but it was great vision nevertheless. So to solve this problem, Steve Wozniak and his friends wrote this game. It's called the breakout game. It's a single player game and all you have to do is break the bricks all day long. And it was a great game because you don't need another player to play with. Now, these are the few games that I think are really important in the history of gaming. But what about my history of games? I have been playing games all my life. If you ask me, I can divide my lifespan so far into three different games that I've played at every age. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to play the soundtrack of each game, and you guys have to identify what game it is. OK? So this is the first soundtrack coming up. There's more, there's more. All right, somebody. Oh, I don't know how to stop this. Yes, you're right, my friend. It's Contra. Uh, I love this game. Uh, I've played it like all my childhood. I've been playing Contra. It's a great game. The original plan was to give away T-shirts when somebody answers, but I somehow managed to, you know, leave my bag of T-shirts at the first transit airport. So I'm really sorry about that. Then, this is the second game. It's very easy, I'm sure you'll get it. <laughs> oh, no. I know you know the answer. <laughs> Most of you have played this game. Personally, I didn't like this game at all, but the problem was, wherever you go, you go to birthday parties, you go to school, you go to playground, kids were talking about this game. And I was kind of left out of conversations there. So I thought, you know what? It's summer holidays. Uh, I need to beat the crap out of this Mario guy and play this game. So I played this game in one of the summer holidays. And eventually, I mean, I'm not bragging or anything, but I kind of crossed all the levels. I mean, not all, but yeah, I was very close to the end. So <laughs> I can't lie because my sister will watch this and she'll be like, you lied on stage. So. <laughs> I would have said all, <laughs> but then that's okay. Moving on to the last game. I absolutely love this game, and it's really hard to identify. Only the true fans would get this. Anyone? Anyone with any guesses? All right. So it's FIFA. <laughs> I've been playing FIFA since FIFA 07, and I still play it. I have even hooked up a PS3 in my office, and whenever I need a break or somebody needs a break, they go and play FIFA. <laughs> all righty. Among all of this, I had this thought that I want to build a game. But why, you would ask. I mean, playing games are fun. Why do you need to build a game? So for first reason, I think games are like our expanding universe. And now consider this, that you're playing a game, and you're the good guy with a gun, and a bad guy comes up, and you shoot the bad guy. So you would think that it's your decision to shoot the bad guy. But I would like to think that it's the game programmer's decision to make you shoot that bad guy, right? So it's like a puppet show. And for once, I would like to be the guy who's controlling all the strings. So I wanted to build a game. Basically, you can say that I wanted to be God for a couple of hours, so. And the second reason is because building games are fun, and you will see it already. So let's start and code a game, right? In your favorite languages, C++, Objective-C, <laughs> right? No, not happening, not today. In Ruby, right? But before we do that, let's see what kind of games we can write in Ruby, right? So I'm here to talk about Gosu. 
So it's only fair we see the kind of games we can build using Gosu. And I'm gonna do this thing. And I'm gonna come here. Alrighty, yes, you could see. So I've, I've been playing this game for so long now. Uh, and I've, I've kind of got bored with it. So do I get any volunteer who would come on stage and play this game for us? Anyone, first row? Anyone? Cool, cool, cool. Come on up. Somebody. Great. Thank you. So, I'll tell you the rules of the game. Uh, this is, if some of you have played the eggs game on Flash, this is one of that. So, your egg is, I mean, this, this particular dragon egg is at the top, and you can move it while you're at the top. And the aim is to drop the egg into the basket. And to drop the egg, you have to press space bar. So, and once you have pressed space bar, for example, right here, you can't move the egg on left or right directions already. And I'll also give you this, that you go for like 10 eggs, you drop 10 eggs, and the best score that has been done is six. So beat that <laughs> already, cool. <laughs> And, oh, we have sound for that. Ah, so close. You have taken a lot more than that. <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Alrighty, this was the first game that I wrote. Now, moving on to the next game. No, not this one. This one, right. So do I get any volunteers for this one? Anyone? Come on, people, great. Come on up. Cool. Thank you for coming. So, the purpose of this game is pretty simple. Uh, you have to type in the word that you see, and as you keep typing in the correct words, the level of difficulty of the words keep increasing, and also the way a word is coming up, uh, the pattern might change, like if you see, oh, sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> that was a shambolic performance. Start, huh? So, one of the rules is you can't press the delete key. Once you have typed in, you have typed in, right? And to submit a word, you have to press enter. Or to get the next word, you have to press enter. So I'll start off from scratch for you. There you go. Go. Ah. Oh, you press, you press. <laughs> Alrighty, that's first word. Not pressing the key is so mean. Yes, that's the fun. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was because I'm drama. This is Z and the <laughs> Y. Cool, now the speed I've increased. Words, and your time is up. And it was a really bad performance. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Moving on to the next game, uh, which one? Let's, let me show you this game. But before I do that, let me just turn it off. And so this was about dragon eggs. And this is one of the process that I follow because I like drawing things and so I like to I like to draw these little things that this is what my game could look like. And it's a really bad drawing, I know. <laughs> the egg does not like, look like an egg. The baskets look weird. But it works for me. This is the second game. This game, which I'm about to show, I've not written this game. Uh, Belin Albeza have written this game. But uh, while I was looking around what are the various options, uh, I found this a pretty good game. And no, 
how much time to shoot that. Great. So I'm gonna play this game for you guys. So the purpose is pretty simple. You have to shoot these aliens and you have like four lives and you have to shoot them all. And it's kind of, they're getting to me, oh man. And I, oh, I'm pretty good at it. I didn't knew that. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. So this is one of the games. And last one is another game which I have not written. When you install Gosu, it comes up with Gosu. It's called Captain Ruby. And basically, it's uh, Dave, if you guys have played Dave. Anyone have played Dave over here? Yeah, some of you have. I, and I'm not really good at all. No, that's easy. Sorry, <laughs> as close as I am before I start sweating. <laughs> so I'm gonna do this again, and we are here. Great. So now that we have seen what kind of games we can build with Gosu, it's only fair that we start hearing something about Gosu, right? It's a 2D game development library for the Ruby and C++ programming languages. It's available for Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. And it works, with, it works great with MRI Ruby, Mac Ruby, and Rubinius, but not so much with JRuby. So please don't try this at home. Then if you're working on, uh, on a Mac, I would suggest that uh, switch to system Ruby instead of RVM backed Ruby because Gosu doesn't really work well with RVM. I have spent hours trying to make them work together and that was not fun at all because the first reason I was looking at Gosu was because I wanted to have fun and write a game, not trying to make them to work together. So I s happily switched to system Ruby and this is the official website. You can find more information over here and this is the official game board. So any game that you write, you can provide the link to the code base of the game or, or, or YouTube link where you can show off what the game is all about. So check this out. Now, I have always thought that game development is like, you need to know big, you need to read big books and you know, know, the, know the game theory and the maths and everything, but not really. You just need to know one concept and that's the simple flowchart. You initialize all the things, you draw all the things, and you keep updating the state of all those things. And you draw again, and you keep updating. Draw, update, draw, update. It's a simple cycle, right? That's all you need to know. So Gosu expects us to write these three methods, initialize, draw, and update. So if I need a background image to my game window, I'm gonna, initial, I'm gonna put that in initialize. For soundtracks, initialize, even for uh, starting of a game, you need to initialize. So all my code will come in initialize method. Then if I want to tell Gosu that go on and draw this particular image at this particular coordinate, you put that code in draw method. And whenever I want to change the state of the game or state of the objects or any interaction that I want to add, you add that in update method. And Gosu will call this update method 60 times in a second. So it's pretty fast. So to understand this a little bit more better, let's break down Dragon Eggs, right? What it had. It had a game window, which you guys saw. It had images and sounds. I call them aesthetics. It had eggs, right? It had baskets. And lastly, it, has, it had collisions, collision between an egg and a basket. Have the egg fallen into the basket or not? You need, you need a way to find that out. So let's start off with game window. So you open a file, empty file in any of your favorite editor. I use Vim all the time. And you require Gosu. And you open up a new class called game. And 
inherit from the gosu window class because we want the object of that and you add a initialize method and you call super over it and uh, in that super we pass in three parameters first parameter tells you the width of the game window which is 800 pixels second no guessing needed height of the game window third parameter it's a boolean value and i have passed in false because it tells you that do you it asks me do you want the users to be able to full screen your game window and i don't want that so i say false and then i add a caption and it's arcam game so let's see this thing in action this is going to be you are doing this every time but that's okay Alrighty. So you guys can probably read this, but I'll make it large. Right. So it's the same code, and at the end, to run a game, I initialize, I create a new object of the game class, and I call show on it. And now, to run a game, I'm going to do this thing so that you can see very clearly what's the game window. Oh, that's not good. And there we go. Cool. Now, this black window is our game window. And at the top, you can see. This is the caption that we wrote. My game. I thought we wrote our campaign. I'll close this thing. And I'm gonna look it again. Oh, sorry. We wrote my game over here, but our game on the slide, so let's change that because it's not my game. And yes, it works. So to close this, I do this. Oh. All right, so moving on, consider this blue part of the screen, your game window. So as you can see, the top leftmost corner is the origin of an XY graph. It's 0, 0. So as you move, as you move towards right, you're increasing in the X coordinate value, right? And that's obvious. There's nothing to tell you about that. but. When you move down from that 0, 0 origin, you're increasing in the y axis value, y coordinate value. And that's different, because in our xy graph, as you move down, you're increasing in the negative side of the y value. And as you move up, you're increasing in the positive side of the y value. But here, it's upside down. So that's one of the things that you should remember while writing your game. Now, as you might have seen that to close a game, I have to take my mouse pointer to that red, red button and close it. And it's really annoying. So one of the things that I do is uh, I add a close action to my game. Like whenever I press escape, just close this game for me, right? It's easy. So and this is one of the practice that I have not picked it up myself. I was watching this talk by Mike and he mentioned that he does it, and I realized, yeah, it's pretty stupid to take the mouse pointer every time. So I've started doing it myself. So this is our earlier code, which is kind of blurred. You don't need to see that. So we add an update method, because now we want to update the state of the game. So as we have seen, we need to add that code in update method. So I'm going to say to Gosu, Gosu, if you see a button being pressed, I ask it by button down method. And if that, if that button being escape key on the keyboard, just close the game window for me, right? So let's see that in action. So it's the same code. We have just added an update method, and at the end, call show on our new game object. And every time I type in wrong, create on the stage. So I don't have to actually 
take the mouse and click on it, I can just press escape. And it's quick and it's easy, right? So Gosu also provides you all these events. Like just like escape key, you can look for KBA, KBB, KB1, 2, 3, whatever. For every key on the keyboard, there's an event in Gosu. Now, moving on to images and sounds. Now, a lot of people that I've talked to who write games in Gosu, what they do is uh, they like to add the sounds and the images to the game. At the end, they would like to uh, create objects which will be part of the gameplay. They would like to add the interaction between them. And when everything is done, they would add the background images. They would add the background soundtracks. But I do it opposite. I like to add them at the beginning because that's how it keeps, keeps me interested in writing that game. Also, it helps me to see the whole picture building up, right? I can see the background images. It helps me to figure out, OK, I need my player over here. I, and this is how they're going to interact. And this is how it will look. So I add the images and sounds first. So now, no guessing needed to add an image and a sound. We're going to open up our initialize method again. Call a super, add it caption. And I'm going to tell Gosu that add an Gosu image for me. And I pass in two parameters, self, which is the game window object, and the path of the file. And I save it in an instance variable. Right? Similarly, the same thing for sound. I tell Gosu, initialize a new sound object, song object for me. And I pass in the same two parameters, the file path and the game window object. And if you have noticed, I've just initialized these objects. I have nowhere told Gosu to go and draw these objects for me or play this object for me. So because that is something that we're supposed to do in the draw method. In the draw method, I'll tell Gosu, that please draw that background image for me at 0, 0 position, which are the first and the second parameter. And third parameter is the z index value. Since it's a background image, I say keep it at z index 0. Similarly, I tell Gosu, go and play this soundtrack for me. And the Boolean value which you see is telling Gosu that when the song or when the soundtrack gets over, restart it, right? Because you don't know how long the game will continue. So you don't want to have a really long sound file. You can keep just a small file and keep playing it again and again. So this is the same program. Yes, you can see. In the draw method, I've set shell to draw these objects. I have initialized these objects over here. It's the same program that I've showed you. Let's just, every single time, let's just run this thing. So we now have the game window, and we have the sound for it. And if you notice that since the origin of the graph is at the top leftmost corner. So the, it starts placing the image from that particular point. So it is your duty to make sure that you have an image which, is, which has the same width and the height as the game window. Now, since I didn't take care of that, you can see a little bit of small block over here in black because the image ends. So it is something that you need to take care of. Moving on to eggs, right? So I needed one background image, so I put that in directly in our in initialize method. I needed one soundtrack in our initialize method. But I'll definitely, definitely be needing more than one eggs, right? One will not suffice. So I open up a new class called egg. And in that class, I add a few attribute accessors, which we'll see why we need them. You can guess the x and y obviously. Then we add an initialize method where we are accepting three parameters. One, 
the window parameter. That means I'll be accepting that please tell me what window you want to draw this object on. So, and the second and third are self-explanatory, X and Y. So I do this, do this, and finally add an image for our egg object, right? And it's just in the initialize method. Then in the draw method, I tell this class to draw that particular image for me at x and y coordinates, z index being one, because I want that particular egg to be over the background image. And then in my original Gosu game window class, I, this is the old code, and I just add this particular code in our initialize method. So I'm initializing an object for the egg class that we just wrote. I'm passing in the window, game window object, accessed by self, and the x and y positions of the egg object I want to be. So let's see this thing in action. It's the same thing. We have just require the egg class. I've if I add components and added I class in it. And there are so many other parameters which I will explain you later. So in our initialize method, I just called egg.new and initialize them at 300, 200. And in my draw method, I just say egg.draw. And there you have it. And it could even move, which we have not seen the code for, but yeah. And switching back again. Already. Now, to add the movement to an egg, it's like you want to update the state of an egg, right? Of the current egg, if I may say. So this is what you'll do. We have already seen the button down method and when user presses escape, we know how to find that particular key. So now I want users to be able to move the egg using the left and the right arrow key. So I'm gonna say if the key is left, decrease its X coordinate value, right? Because when you move right of the origin, you increase the value. So if you're at a particular point, let's say at 300 X value, and if you want to move left, you decrease it, you go towards zero. So I decrease the value by five. And if I want to move right, I increase the value by five. Now, similarly, I want the eggs to be able to free fall, right? Because when the user presses a space, he should be able, the egg should be able to move down without any breaks. So this is what I do. I add up a free fall method in my egg class, and in that, the attribute access of which I just used, I set that as true. And similarly, in my game window, original game window class, I open up the update method again, and I just say that keep increasing the y value by five if that particular egg has been set true for free falling, right? And it will keep increasing it. It will keep uh, increasing the value of the y coordinate of x because uh, it keeps calling the update method 60 times in a second. So you will you will not see any breaks in it. You will see a smooth transition happening. And let's see this in code. Does it really work? There you have your egg and you can move it and it falls. Now, again. Now, keep notice that when I press space bar and I press a left arrow key, the egg moves in the left direction. So this is something that you have to take care of, right? So you have to pass in conditions that if the egg has been like set for free falling, uh, do not call the left and the right arrow key movement or something like that. <coughs> we have 
already seen this. Oh, I'm sorry, we have not. Yes. Yes. So now we know how to uh, do a free fall, but we have also written a method called free fall bang, and we're going to use that method in the update itself. And I'll say, just set that particular egg true for free falling. Now, what about multiple eggs, right? Because you don't need just one egg in it. You need multiple eggs on the screen. But you also want to be able to use to just see one egg at a time. So there are a couple of ways you can do it. One, every time the egg has completely fallen, you initialize a new egg object and draw that object on the screen. This is one way people do it. The other way is by placing the eggs, like if you have decided that you're going to have 20 eggs in the game, so instead of initializing at runtime, you can place all your eggs on the screen at such, at such coordinates that user only sees one egg at a time. So just see this code. I say I initialize an empty array, and let's say I've decided I want 20 eggs in the game. So I add a new game object, a new egg object every time. And in the X coordinate, I have passed in something like 400 into D plus 400, where D is the iterator count. So for the first time the loop runs, it will place an egg at 400 position, and I'll be able to see it. But for the second time, it will place an egg at 400 plus 400, 800th position. And since my game window is 800 pixels long, I don't see what's happening after that, right? So I initialize all the eggs such a way they are difference of 400. So the second egg will be at 800, the third egg 1200, 1600, and so on. And in the draw method, I say something like this to draw each egg, right? It's simple. So when the egg have completely fallen, for example, I just press space and the egg have fallen into the basket and it's moving with the basket. I just, uh, I just uh, decrease the coordinate by 400, x coordinate by 400 of every egg, which is subsequent to that egg, right? So the next egg, which was at 800, will now come down to 400. And after that, which was at 1200, will now come down to 800. So I don't really have to manage the eggs uh, initialization dynamically. And I like doing this because it's, it's easy. Now baskets. Same thing, really, right? We don't have to talk about baskets separately, except that you want these baskets to be able to move, you know, keep moving. So now we have seen how egg can keep free falling. So now we can guess how the basket can keep moving towards the left. No biggie. Now, at last, the most important thing, collision. So Gosu provides us with this method to identify if the distance between the two passed in parameters, x, y coordinate of the first x, y coordinate and the second x, y coordinate, are, they, are the distance between them zero. It works for some cases, but not for every game. Now, for example, I wrote a separate collision method, and I'll tell you why. Look at this image. Now, I want at when the distance between these two objects should, be, should not be zero, and then I can say it's, it's under collision. But how do we come up with this method, right? I've said basket's x coordinate should be less than x coordinate of egg, which we can see in this image, right? The basket's x coordinate, which is right here, should be less than the x coordinate of the egg, which makes sense. I'm sorry. But the second line, the difference between the x coordinate of the egg and the basket should be between 0 and 35. Now, how do I come up with such values? So, to understand that, let me create. So, now I have printed the x, y coordinate of the egg and the ring. So, now our egg is right here. So, 
I'll move this thing here. Right. So as I move towards left, the x coordinate keeps decreasing. As I move towards right, the x coordinate keeps increasing. And you're seeing so many log outputs because I have added this in the update method. And Gosu is calling that 60 times. So that's why it's keep printing it. Now as I move down, the y coordinate is increasing. Now I know when the egg is somewhat hair, 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 it's into the basket. But when it's like this, it's not really into the basket. So now look at the difference between the x coordinates. It should be zero, so something like that. And the end range of that particular coordinate should be somewhere here. So I say that the x coordinate of egg is at 625 and the y coordinate of x coordinate of ring is at 600. So the difference should be but somewhere between zero and 30. So that's how I come up with such values. Same thing for y coordinate. I know that this is not the correct state of egg being fallen into the basket. The y value should be something you can guess around with uh, by printing such values. So I can safely say that the y coordinate of the egg should always be less than y coordinate of the basket, right? Because then I'll have that effect that egg is actually just over the basket. And you can come up with such values using the same process. Now, moving on to the building blocks. These are the four building blocks of the game. You need to come up with an idea. You need images, you need sounds, and you need fonts. Now, these are the four things that takes a lot of time. Writing a game is, you have seen, it's super easy. But you need the correct idea. So what's my inspiration for it? I've built games that I've played in my childhood. So you can do that. All, any games that you've played, you can try to replicate them. Images, you can use these links. Uh, you can download free images from these two sites. But especially on Flickr, if, if you're downloading images from Flickr, uh, just make sure that you're downloading images which provide you creative license to download. Uh, otherwise, the owner of the image can sue you for inappropriate use. So just beware of that. And there are licenses like you can't use it for commercial purposes. You can use it for art or some side projects or something. So use that license. For sounds, this is a great site. You can download free sounds from it. Similarly, for fonts. These are the few resources that you have. Uh, this is the official Gosu library, uh, Gosu GitHub repo, and the Gosu library. And then the third link is my GitHub account. You can look at the other games that I've written. I've written a couple of more games, which were not worthy enough to show here. So I'm not sure then. <laughs> so and then this YouTube link. Uh, it's a talk by Mike Murray, which I just mentioned in the previous slides. It's a great talk. If you find this thing remotely interesting, you should definitely look at his talk also. That's a thank you. <laughs>